morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome to the 200th anniversary of the Harvard Law School. Uh, welcome to alums, to current students, um, to fellow faculty, um, and to this panel, this panel discussion. The topic for this morning is uh, religion and law at the Harvard Law School. And uh, before you, uh, you have <clears throat> three current faculty members, my colleagues Intisar Rob and Charlie Donahue, myself, Noah Feldman. Uh, each of us connected in one way or another to one of the um, big, well-known uh, Western monotheistic traditions. Well, I guess in the case of mine, not so big. But other than that, <laughs> other than that uh, relatively well-known. Um, by coincidence, I think, we're also all three originally trained as medievalists. But don't that, let that cause you to all get up and leave the room right now and find a better session. Um, the Middle Ages may come up today, uh, here and there. Um, but it's not the sole uh, topic of conversation. Um, in historical terms, we're going to span the, the whole gamut. We're going to talk about the origins, development, and the Harvard Law School uh, past and present of these religious traditions. And we'll even touch at least a little bit on a couple of the other bigger uh, world religious traditions. So I'm uh, thrilled that you're all here. We will each speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we will open it up for a conversation. And we're very excited to hear your perspectives, views, and uh, potentially agreements and disagreements. Um, last but not least, um, those of you who are graduates of the school know that you can't really have a discussion at the Harvard Law School without a lectern. So we have restored the lectern to its natural and appropriate place. But Charlie has promised me that he's not going to cold call. Is that? <laughs> yep. All right. The floor is yours, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I want to dissociate myself from the title of this session, God on Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, none of us sitting at this table is a theologian. Uh, and I suspect that few, if any, of you are. And to do justice to that title, you'd have to be a theologian. Uh, what we agreed that we would talk about and to try to get you to talk about is the relationship between religion and the Harvard Law School. That in itself is a huge topic, uh, one to which we can hardly do justice in an hour and a half. So let me try to narrow it down uh, by offering a few remarks about what, might, what one might say about law and religion and the Harvard Law School in the context of what purports to be the 200th anniversary of the school. And then I'd like to say just a little bit more about a topic that I find fascinating, which is religious systems of law and their relationship to secular systems of law. And since I'm an historian, those remarks are likely to say something about history, a history that curiously, and this is something we might talk about afterwards, is very hard to connect to the history of the Harvard Law School. <laughs> So as I suspect most of you know, Harvard College was founded in 1636 to train ministers of the gospel. The gospel is understood by the Puritan wing of the church in England, though not the church of England. Uh, that mission continued for some time, but a year before the date that we're celebrating today, the governing boards founded the Harvard Divinity School, making one might imagine a statement that the professional training of, administ of ministers was not a function of Harvard College. I suspect, however, that the governing boards would, in 1816, would have been quite amazed if one drew from the foundation of the Divinity School the conclusion that religion had nothing to do with Harvard University except in the Divinity School. That is to say that the function of the rest of the university was to devote itself to secular learning. They might, however, have thought that religion had relatively little to do with the professional training of lawyers. Uh, for which they founded another school in 1817. Now, as Dan Kokolet's recent book has shown, the Harvard Law School prior to Langdell's becoming dean in 1870 was a pretty sorry place. The professors lectured. The students slept through the lectures if they went to them at all. Uh, the real teaching was done by what today we would call TAs. Uh, it focused on filling out forms. Uh, with a little bit about what we would call advocacy. 
If religion played any role in the curriculum or in what passed for scholarship in that period, it has left little or no record. The intellectual content of the curriculum and the effectiveness of the teaching improved considerably under Langdell and the group that he gathered around him. Most of them, however, had a decidedly secular bent, at least in their teaching and writing. James Barr Ames actually taught medieval history for a brief period, and he wrote about medieval, the medieval history of the common law. It's a pretty strange medieval history that says nothing about religion, but that's what he wrote. So if we want to say something about the history of religion and law at the Harvard Law School, we might talk about four men who are no longer with us, but three of whom I knew uh, and one of whom I could have known. Mark DeWolf Howe, John Mansfield, Hal Berman, and Bill Stuntz. Howe is the one whom I did not know, so I leave it to Noah to discuss his contributions to the topic of the constitutional law of church and state. Mansfield was a friend and in some ways a protege of Howe's. Mansfield took over the teaching of a separate course in church and state after Howe's untimely death. Mansfield became fascinated with India, a place where the fact of religious pluralism was treated in a very different way from the way that is treated in the United States. Fascination with India in turn led Mansfield to an interest in Hindu law, a topic about which Mansfield knew quite a bit, although he never wrote anything about it. After Hal Berman stopped writing about Soviet law, he turned his attention to Western legal history and published a great deal, perhaps too much. Uh, his main contribution was to popularize the notion that the revival of legal studies that took place in the early 12th century in Western Europe was the result of the conflict between kingdom and priesthood in the late 11th century, the conflict that we associate with the reform movement under Pope Gregory VII. Berman's Law and Revolution I is still widely read. That, in a way, is a shame because the book is full of embarrassing factual errors. <laughs> His account, however, of the emergence of, the, of a distinctively Western law in the Middle Ages and his emphasis on canon law as the driving force behind that emergence are both well worth considering. Now, how Mansfield and Berman were all personally quite religious. That may well account for their interest in topics that we normally associate with law and religion. Bill Stuntz was also personally quite religious. I remember that he hesitated to accept our offer to join the faculty until he was sure that he could find a church in the area in which he felt at home. Stuntz's religious commitments are not directly evident in his writings. I suppose it might be possible for somebody without Bill's religious commitments to write a book like The Collapse of American Criminal Justice, but the depths of its critique and the power of its argument were certainly informed by the fact that the author took the golden rule seriously and tried to live it. So how Mansfield and Berman and Stuntz are now gone, uh, where are we now? Well, there are many ways in which law and religion is studied and taught at the Harvard Law School today. I'd like to focus on one. You'll recall that John Mansfield became interested in Hindu law uh, as a religious legal system. There's no one in Harvard Law School today who's carrying on his work in Hindu law, but quite a bit is going on about religious legal systems. In the late 1980s, Caroline and Joseph Gross endowed a visiting professorship in Jewish law at the Harvard Law School. We've had a series of distinguished visiting professors in that position. In 1991, the school formally created an Islamic legal studies program, which is now directed by two Harvard Law School professors, one of whom is sitting on my right. Western canon law is featured in the Continental European Legal History course that I teach and in my seminar on the same topic. So what's a religious legal system? Let me turn to two documents that appear at the very beginning of two legal systems, one of which is still very much with us, and one of which, though no longer with us, remains hugely influential. 
The first document begins, I am the Lord thy God who delivered thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thyself a graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in the heavens above the earth, beneath of the waters below the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. And the second one begins, if someone calls someone else to law, let him go. Now, the first is, of course, the Ten Commandments, uh, and I won't attempt to date them, but if you say 1400 BCE, nobody can prove you wrong. Uh, the second is the opening passage of the Roman Twelve Tables, probably of 450 BCE. One can draw a simple conclusion from these passages. The source of law in the Ten Commandments is God. The source of law in the Twelve Tables is not stated, but tradition says that they were Roman statute, adopted by the Roman people, or at least by all the free men. It's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but I think you can see that in, if your fundamental text says that the source of law is God, the way you go about analyzing in order to develop a legal system is likely to proceed somewhat differently from the way that you would go about analyzing in order to develop a legal system if your fundamental <coughs> is that the source of law is a very old statute. Now, that the Jews and the Muslims started with the proposition that the ultimate source of law is God is, I think, undeniable. And the result in both cases was religious legal systems of considerable interest and complexity. They can be studied by those who are neither Jews nor Muslims. And the result of such study, as in the case with all comparative and historical studies that are well done, is to expand the student's understanding of the possible. It has to be done carefully. Resist the temptation to make facile generalizations. They are almost certainly going to be wrong. If you really want to get into the mind of someone in another legal system, it really helps to use the language that the person in the other legal system used. If that's not possible, get yourself a teacher who does know the language. So that brings me to religious, a religious legal system about which I know more than I do about the Halakha and the Sharia. Uh, although, uh, and that's Western canon law. At no time does it look like the Halakha or the Sharia, although there are times when it seems to be approaching it. So we can ask two questions. The first one is, what did Western canon law look like when it was approaching the halakha and the sharia? And the second question is, why did it never make it? Uh, so to answer the first question, let me offer just an example. In the middle of a complicated argument about the validity and efficacy of the sacraments of Simoniacs, Gratian of Bologna, writing around 1140, makes the following puzzling observation. It's not true, he says, that the fact that Jesus healed the ear of Malchus means that the sacraments of Simoniacs impart the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, all four Gospels tell us that when Judas came with the soldiers of the high priest to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of Jesus' disciples drew his sword and cut off the ear of a slave of the high priest. John's Gospel tells us that the slave's name was Malchus, and Luke's Gospel tells us that Jesus healed the slave's ear. Each of the Gospel writers uses this story for somewhat different purposes, but there's nothing about the way this story is told in any of the Gospels that even vaguely hints that it might have something to do with simony. As a result, there's nothing puzzling about Gratian's statement that the healing of Malchus' ear does not tell us that the sacraments of Simoniacs in part grace. What's puzzling is that it was necessary for Gratian to say so. Uh, now, the answer is that, that, that Peter and Damien, almost a century before Gratian, had said that the story of the healing of Malchus's ear did tell us something about simony. Now, to back up. Everyone in the 11th and 12th century thought that simony, the purchase and sale of church rights and offices, was wrong. It had been condemned by numerous high authorities from the very beginning of the Christian church. The question in the 11th and 12th century was what to do when it had happened, and that was a new question <coughs> at the time. 
The extreme position was that simony rendered anything that followed as a result of it totally void. If a bishop paid money to be ordained, he wasn't a bishop. And all the priests he were ordained were not priests. Peter Damien took a more moderate position, analogizing the betrayal of Jesus by Judas for 30 pieces of silver to simony, Peter had argued that the fact that Jesus healed Malchus's ear showed that the grace of the Holy Spirit could operate even in the context of simony. The analogy, to put it mildly, is flawed. Even if we accept the analogy of the sale of Jesus to simony, it's not Judas, the putative simoniac, who healed Malchus's ear, it was Jesus. Hence, the healing of Malchus's ear tells us nothing about the sacraments of Simoniacs, and that's exactly what Gratian says. But then he backs away. The story, he says, can, however, be understood in this way. Just as Christ's soul did not confer the gifts of his grace on the seller or the buyer, but on those who were present unknowing, for whom he prayed on the cross, so too the Holy Spirit may be shown to bestow the effects of his grace not on the seller or the buyer, but on those who are by ignorance led to receive the Lord's sacraments from their hands. Gratian thus anticipates what's going to ultimately be his resolution of the troublesome problem of those who had been ordained without simony by a simoniacal bishop. And if they didn't know that the bishop was a simoniac, they were both validly and efficaciously ordained. In gracious hands, then, Peter Damien's far-out analogy is made to serve the ultimate resolution of the problem. Now, Gracian's solution, in my view, was a good one. What makes Gracian's solution a good one is not only that he uses a piece of the tradition rather than just throwing it away, not only that he uses it in a way that supports his ultimate practical resolution of this problem of the sacraments of Simoniacs, but also in doing so, he's truer to Luke's text than any of the other previous authors had been. One of the main points of Luke's passion narrative is how Jesus reacted in the face of evil, how he healed Malchus's ear, how he forgave those who crucified him, how he forgave the repentant thief. Now, I'm not saying that the nature of Gratian's argument is the only thing that characterizes religious legal systems, but it points to a pretty important characteristic. Those who are good at it, and Gratian was very good at it, use the entire religious tradition, including pieces of it that at first glance seem to have nothing to do with law to uh, shape their system building. Okay, if that's what was going on in canon law in the 11th and 12th centuries, it's far less characteristic of canon law prior to the 11th century, and it ceased to be characteristic of canon law in the 13th century. Why? It's a very complicated story. Let me just give you a few bullet points. The first six centuries of Christianity had made relatively, I emphasize, relatively little effort to create a distinctively Christian legal system. That was for a complicated series of reasons that include the opposition of Jesus to the legalism of the Pharisees reported in all four Gospels, the decision not to subject Gentile converts to all the requirements of Jewish law, the separation of Jews from Christians following the first destruction of Jerusalem, the influence of Greek as opposed to Roman and Jewish thought on the development of early Christianity, and the necessity for Christianity to deal with the law in Roman legal terms once it became the official religion of the empire. Law is there, but it's relegated to a subordinate position. But by the end of the 11th century, all of this had changed. Gentile converts were rare, and no one was suggesting that they must be circumcised and obey the laws of Kashrut. The differences between Christianity and Judaism were all too firmly established. The influence of Greek thought was not strong, and Roman law had almost been forgotten. The questions that the church was faced with were legal ones, or could be seen as legal ones. The questions were certainly more legal than what had occupied the church councils at the time of the great early councils. In this atmosphere, the time was ripe for the development of a distinctively Christian legal system. But after the 12th century, that changed. A legal system was developed. We call it the Ius Commune. It was a combination of Roman law and canon law. And the fact that that happened that way had three results. First, 
canon law didn't pretend to be a comprehensive legal system. Not only did it rely on Roman law for much of private law, but it also didn't pretend to be comprehensive about behavior. It's characteristic of religious legal systems that they deal both with what we call law and what we call morals. Canon law doesn't do that. Secondly, canon law, except in the 11th and 12th century, did not base itself on the fundamental sources of the religion. They lay elsewhere, in the Bible, the creeds, the liturgy, the writings of the church fathers. Third, canon law, except in the 11th and 12th centuries, never used in any great, to any great extent the interpretive method that I've outlined in the story of Malchus's ear. <coughs> canon law, except in that period, sought to bypass the interpretive process by getting a ruling from an existing authority. In the Middle Ages, that authority was the Pope. It remained so for Catholics, and the Protestants found other authorities. Canon law thus endowed those authorities with legislative power, making interpretation of the basic sources unnecessary in many instances. Now, whether the result of all of that is that Western canon law is not a religious legal system, or just that it's different from those of Judaism and Islam, I leave it to you to decide. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Good to start. I'll try not to take his identity <laughs> and assume my own. <laughs> so thank you for everyone who arranged this uh, panel uh, and the, the occasion to for us to reflect on the history of law and religion at Harvard Law School and beyond. And so that might be my alternative title for the panel or subtitle, The Past, Present, and Future of Islamic law in this case at Harvard and beyond. Um, so what I want to do is talk about uh, the past, present, and future of Islamic law with the idea of situating the study of Islamic law and its relevance at Harvard and more broadly in three areas, legal education, law and policy, uh, and new technology as it connects to both. And Harvard has always, of course, played a big and leading role in all of these areas, um, and perhaps a unique role in, in being a law school that connects, uh, that, that leads in legal education and connects law to policy uh, and embraces new technology in doing so. So let's start with legal education. When it comes to uh, the study of Islamic law in the West, uh, when we look at it, we see that Islamic law was studied prior to Harvard, really only in specialized department, uh, departments in the university or divinity schools. Typically, it was studied in an area studies department, uh, like Near Eastern languages uh, or Middle Eastern studies and the like, religion, uh, religious studies departments, sometimes but more rarely in history departments. Uh, it really uh, began in that way in the West in the early and mid 20th century. Um, so that's academic study of Islamic law. And then meanwhile, in the Muslim world, there's the traditional study of Islamic law, where there was a stark dichotomy that, that emerged between the traditional studies and these newer academic studies. So take, for example, the venerable institution of Islamic study in the majority Sunni Muslim world called Al-Azhar. It was a university established in 1975. It's, it's called the first uh, degree granting university um, in the world. And the curriculum then, in the 10th century, was pretty similar to what it is today. Better There's say Azhar, 975, not 1975. I'm sorry, 975. <laughs> there was a look of shock on people's minds. <laughs> So the curriculum uh, largely stayed the same. So there's a heavy emphasis on fiqh, which is the uh, juristic interpretation of the sources that uh, Professor Donahue talked about. Um, so the doctrine or substantive rules of diverse schools of Islamic law. Uh, there's an emphasis on usul al-fiqh, or Islamic jurisprudence, methods of interpretation, and related fields, theology, Quranic studies, 
studies of the life of Muhammad the prophet and his words and saying and, and actions or hadith. Um, Arabic morphology and linguistics necessary for interpreting these texts um, often philologically uh, and the like. So back in the 10th century and then all the way uh, through the, the 19th and 20th century, uh, the experts in Islamic law tended to be graduates from Al-Azhar and institutions like it in the Muslim world. Um, so the judges, the jurists, who, who are, as I'm calling, the legal experts in Islamic law and muftis, those who issued opinions on individual questions and uh, tried to get at uh, hard questions of Islamic law, all would have come from places like Al-Azhar. Uh, so then in the uh, 19th, late 19th and 20th centuries, uh, this changes. Uh, the changes accompany the legal and governmental structural changes in the Muslim world, both colonial and non-colonial. So these uh, many nation states, newly emerged nation states in the Muslim world now adopted constitutions, uh, tripart systems of governance, secular systems of legal education. So at the time, Azhar is still there. It's still training students just like it does today. But the graduates of Al-Azhar now go on to become religious leaders, imams or, or prayer leaders in mosques. Uh, perhaps even the state mufti, this Islamic law expert that issues advisory opinions on difficult questions that individuals may have. But to be a lawyer who litigates cases in court or a judge who decides on statutory and constitutional legal issues or a law professor in one of the new law schools, you have to go to a secular law school in the Muslim world where the curriculum is actually more similar to our curriculum here than it is to any traditional curriculum uh, from the earlier Azhar model. So at a place like Cairo University, for example, uh, as a prominent judge on the, on the Egyptian Supreme Court now, um, and who was a graduate of Cairo University once told me, students took you know, the, the courses that we would expect to take here, contracts, criminal law, procedure, et cetera. Um, at most, they were offered one or two classes on Islamic law, and then it was from an academic perspective rather than from a traditional or religious perspective. So even this is, this is the case, even though Islamic law in Egypt is actually this, a source, it, in the Constitution it says it's the source, of state law, and it requires judges, including this judge who sits on, the, on Egypt's Supreme Constitutional Court, to interpret matters of Islamic law, often having to decide cases where the academic secular vision of Islamic law <coughs> may clash with traditional ideas of Islamic law. It's usually then that those cases come to court for adjudication by uh, the judges sitting on it. And so even when the university is uh, in, in places like Cairo, and I'm using Cairo as a stand-in for the, the majority Muslim world, uh, they still see it as traditional study. So the universities have a faculty of law where you might take one or two courses in Islamic law. Um, and then they have a department of Sharia. And that is, that is sort of the university equivalent of the traditional institutions. And it's meant for those training to be religious officials or scholars not to work in the, the courts or to contribute to the academic literature on Islamic law. And so this is true all, all over the Muslim world. Morocco has the Qarawiyin Mosque that teaches traditional Islamic law alongside modern universities. Pakistan has the Dioband Institute that teaches traditional studies in Islamic law alongside modern universities. Iran and Iraq have the Faiziyah and the Najaf uh, Hausa seminary system, uh, and I could go on. So all of these institutes, uh, they teach the traditional Islamic studies, and they've got uh, university systems alongside it. Um, so now let me step back a second and, and talk about then, well, by contrast, what do I mean by the academic study uh, of Islamic law, or, or really the traditional versus academic study? And so as I noted um, a couple of minutes ago, the traditional study is really about teaching Islamic law to believers, the do's and the don'ts, typically referring to rules that are believed to have been devised by, or 
believed to have been uh, promulgated by God himself or herself, himself in this case. Um, so it's never really, uh, these traditional studies were never really updated to address uh, issues of state law and governance um, or individual practice in most of the Muslim world once Islamic governance systems were replaced by Western style governance uh, in, in, the, in the modern nation state. Now in the academic study of Islamic law, uh, what I mean is, uh, what I mean to refer to as three main approaches, all of which draw on or look to the traditional sources of Islamic law as sources, but they uh, do not look at them from an internal religious perspective, um, understanding them to come from God, but they look at them in a, uh, with, with various approaches that go to the, the following three areas. So one is Islamic law as comparative law. Uh, what are the legal concepts that uh, Islamic law has and may share or may diverge from other <coughs> concepts, concepts in other legal systems. Um, what does it mean for a state constitution to incorporate Islamic law as a source or the source of law? Who interprets that law? What is the content of that law? Um, so these are some of the comparative constitutional, uh, constitutionalism questions that emerge. How is the government structured? What is the relationship between rights that are in the constitution the incorporation of rights and the incorporation of Islamic law and structures that are set to decide those. And how do Islamic legal concepts and tools compare uh, to other uh, debated and discussed legal concepts like judicial independence, legal authority, procedural norms? How can they be explained? What function do they serve? So sort of the functionalist method in uh, comparative law. So that's one. A second is Islamic legal history, um, both social and intellectual history. What are the events of the past pertaining to various facets of Islamic law? How might particular laws be analyzed in historic contexts? Who were the individuals who, in fact, <coughs> operated uh, to construct legal systems um, in Islamic societies, and how? And how and why did these laws and systems change over, term, over time in terms of Islamic law's effect on society? And then third is issues of contemporary Islamic law and society. So sociological aspects of the law. How did Islamic law affect social and cultural norms and vice versa? Um, put differently, what was the Islamic law on the books versus the Islamic law in action? How do various areas like family law, criminal law, commercial law, for example, in Islamic contexts affect the lives of ordinary people, inform government policies? Um, and more generally, how does a contemporary conception and practice of Islamic law affect questions of governance in light of these laws, laws uh, and rights in the Muslim world and outside of it? So connecting the, the two ideas about traditional and academic studies, the point here is that Islamic law has historically been divided between these two spheres, and it's all the more so uh, today. So traditional studies and academic studies, they both go to different ends. And often there's a lack of any organic link between the two, even in the Muslim world. Um, those who study Islamic law academically frequently don't have the language or grammar, um, again, that Professor Donahue referred to, to grasp the traditional study of Islamic law um, and vice versa, making the whole thing somewhat uh, obscure and completely disconnected. So the two are not frequently in conversation with each other. So enter Harvard Law School here. Harvard was the first school uh, that, that I've been able to track down, first law school, to offer courses in Islamic law beginning in the 1960s. So it recognized that if it was truly going to be a global law school and a worldwide leader in legal education, it needed to offer courses on the legal systems of the world. And that would, of course, include Islamic law as a major legal tradition. 
At the time, Harvard hosted a series of Islamic law scholars of considerable renown and prominence from the majority Muslim world. Um, most of them were scholars in Islamic law scholars in the traditional sense. And they tended to lack legal training, but they were well versed in traditional modes of Islamic law. And they could speak English to at least try to communicate these ideas, even if the legal language was not the same at that time. Um, so there, there's another link, actually, to Islamic law then um, here at Harvard uh, amongst the, the constellation of colleagues that Professor Donahue mentioned, and that's Arthur von Maron, uh, the great comparative law scholar, um, who was the one who invited this series of traditional Islamic law scholars to Harvard. And then again, in 1976, Harvard was a pioneer in Islamic law programming when it created of the first Islamic law fund to support the study of Islamic law at Harvard um, or at any law school in the US through a $300,000 $300, gift uh, from a former LLM student um, at the time. Then fast forward about 15 years. Um, Again, as, as we heard mentioned, in 1991, you see the establishment of the Islamic Legal Studies Program, uh, which I direct uh, with a colleague, with the idea of promoting the academic study of Islamic law as law, um, specifically comparative law. Uh, Professor Frank Vogel had been brought in as a lecturer in law four years prior to that, and when he was made an assistant professor in 1991. He worked with Dean Robert Clark, and I guess we can consider him another person who was in, involved in, amongst our colleagues or fa current faculty in the study of uh, law and religion, because he really helped uh, go on a fundraising tour with uh, Professor Vogel to launch an $11 million fundraising campaign to endow the center and make sure that it had funds uh, to really make Harvard the world's leading institution in, this, in the academic study of Islamic law. Um, so this all resulted in a gift of $5 million in 1993, and then by 1998, they had achieved their goal uh, with a total market value of the capital having reached $11.5 million. So the, the origins of the gifts were, um, they're interesting in as much as they're telling of, of the weight and significance of Islamic law in the world. So some of them came from individuals and governments in the Muslim world, including uh, the governments of Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. And they also came from major companies that did work in the Middle East and the Muslim world. So for example, uh, we have the Boeing Company Reference Library for Islamic Law on floor one of Langdell Library. Um, we also have a big McDonnell Douglas Corporation <laughs> gift as a part of uh, what started the Islamic Legal Studies program. Uh, and the express purpose of these gifts uh, was it was very specific um, and threefold. So one was to support the teaching of Islamic law at Harvard Law School through an endowed chair, which my colleague holds, the custodian of the two holy mosques chair in Islamic law. Uh, another was to support uh, library research and collections and, and really build a large collection uh, of sources on Islamic law, which they did and so which we have. And then the third was to support programming and scholarship in Islamic legal studies um, <laughs> by funding uh, activities, lectures, fellowships, and scholars working on these issues. And since there's been a, since then, so since the 90s, there's been a far uh, reaching expansion of the field of Islamic legal studies. So the top three law schools, for example, either have centers, Harvard has, a, has the Islamic legal studies program, Yale has a center for the, Yale Law School has a center for the study of Islamic law and civilizations. Um, Stanford is now hiring for a professor of Islamic law. And there are another 16, um, leading or, or top 40 schools that have um, professorships or programs in Islamic law, all looking to Harvard as a pioneer in the study uh, and, and sort of the, the current activities that we do here. Uh, so I wanna, uh, that, that was all uh, about 
uh, legal education, I just want to say a few things about the other two things, and that's sort of the past of legal education. I want to say something about the present of Islamic law and policy and the future uh, with respect to uh, Islamic law and technology. So for the present, let's, um, I, th I think that we can, we can all sort of look around us, look at the newspapers, and acknowledge that in this climate today, Islamic law or Sharia um, is sort of the boogeyman, gets a bad rap. Uh, so the recent rhetoric about Islamic law, um, it really, ref it, it's reflected in, in an effort to uh, maybe score political points and, and at some times it's uh, served to legalize discrimination against Muslims in the United States. Um, I was involved in a case recently where the claim was that store owners could lawfully exclude patrons who seem to be Muslim because of their understanding uh, that Islamic law, which you can assume any Muslim must follow by virtue of being Muslim, even though that's not true, um, requires Muslims to have violent intentions and to lie about it. Um, and so this is actually a, a case that's being you know, litigated in federal court. Um, it wasn't just a uh, slam dunk lose for, for the store proprietors, and, and it's just one of many cases. There are all kinds of uh, bans on Sharia um, in, in state courts. The one should question whether uh, you know, that's really a, a ding against Islamic law or against the judges who, it's really a signal that they haven't been trained to apply the laws of the land as, already, um, uh, as they already do. So, uh, and, and then of course there are the Muslim bans. There was um, Muslim ban 1.0, 2.0, um, both defeated in, in the federal courts, and then 3.0, um, that's been somewhat diluted, but also blocked by courts in, in Hawaii and Maryland. And I think all of this comes from misinformation or lack of information at best and deliberate uh, misinformation about Islamic law uh, at worst. And in some ways, perhaps it's continuing uh, a series of negative conceptions about Islamic law as the other. You sort of cite Islamic law as an arbitrary system as our own Justice uh, Felix Frankfurter uh, did in a famous case, Terminello versus Chicago, where he said, well, we're not like these, this isn't Qadi justice here. It's not like we're sitting under a tree dispensing justice at, uh, at whim, um, but we actually believe in reasoned uh, deliberation of law and uh, we issue rules on that basis. So in some ways, this is a continuum um, sort of the, the farthest extreme of this continuum, linking uh, Islamic law with um, discriminatory policies or, uh, or, or placing it in negative light. And again, I'd say that that, that has to do with um, this disconnect between the legal education and the world of uh, the connection between law and policy that Harvard typically has. But I think there is hope, and so I want to end on that note in talking about the future. Um, uh, I've painted a sort of bleak picture about the, uh, the policy, um, but bringing together the education and policy notes, then I think we can leave with, I can leave with a, a couple of things. One is that legal education is indeed expanding um, on Islamic law, and there are sources now for it in a way that there weren't before. Um, and I think that's a positive thing. Um, one of the, the big projects that we have now at the Islamic Legal Studies Program um, is an attempt to make sort of the, the West Law or SCOTUS blog for Islamic law, um, collect and organize the world's information on Islamic law and make it and present it in a way that's accessible and useful to educators, to the average user. Um, I know of the importance of this from my own trajectory. I had to be at the three leading institutions that had large collections for the study of Islamic law, large uh, library collections at Princeton, where I did a PhD, at Yale, 
where I did a JD, and then here at Harvard once I joined the faculty. And I also had to travel to more than 10 countries just to gain access to sources. So it shouldn't be that, that way. And so um, technology comes in uh, to help with the earlier project of, of pr increasing access to Islamic law. And I think that uh, could have very real effects on at least informing the public conversation when it comes to law and policy. Um, will there be changes in the traditional study of Islamic law? Uh, probably not, just like the advent of the printing press didn't really change uh, fundamentally the, the studies of Islamic law in places like, places like Al-Azhar. But that's also not the point. Um, the academic study of Islamic law with increased access to sources and, and placing those sources in context by scholars of it uh, will radically change Islamic legal studies, I believe, and the policies attached to it. And a lot of that starts, started long ago here at Harvard Law School and will continue. Thanks, Nadezhar. I was hoping you were going to leave that there. I was going to assume your identity, and that was going to be a good thing for me. <laughs> what I'd like to do uh, in the time that we have, and I want to make sure we, we leave time for uh, substantial conversation, is touch on three interrelated themes. Uh, the first is the question of definition. And basically, it's a question of what it means for the self-definition of any law school, and certainly this law school, that we do engage, or as I will argue for much of the past, did not engage with religious legal systems and religious ideas of law. So that'll be part one. Part two will be about the doctrine of church and state in the US, that is to say the constitutional law of religion, primarily the free exercise clause and establishment clause, and I'll say a bit about Harvard Law School's deeply ambivalent, I would even say skeptical role uh, in thinking about those clauses and its role in those clauses. And last but not least, I'll cycle back around to the question of identity, and I'll mention what, um, for those of you who know the old joke, you might call Harvard Law and the Jewish question. OK, so uh, let's start with definition. If you think of a law school as essentially a professional school, in the positive sense of that term, its primary goal is to prepare people to practice law. Seen from that perspective, it's not at all obvious that we should focus in our pedagogy or in our faculty on religious legal systems in which, for the most part, our students will not be practicing that form of law. Now, I don't mean to say that we don't have the occasional student who argues a canon law case, um, but it's not the common run of the mill. Um, we have many students uh, who come as LLM students from countries in which Islamic law functions as part of the legal system. But to be completely honest about it, if they really want to learn how to practice criminal law in Pakistan in blasphemy cases, um, the seminars and classes that they can take here, which we hope will be very helpful for them, um, won't be determinative of that uh, practical experience for them. And when it comes to Jewish law, uh, again, there are cases in Israel in which Jewish law has practical, real-world legal significance. But the students of ours who will practice that form of law are typically Israelis who can study that in Israel. So why do we do it? And more to the point, why didn't we do it for a long time? I think the answer has to do with the changing conception of what a law school is and what legal education is supposed to be. A broader definition of legal education still sees it as professional, but sees part of the job of the law school being teaching students who will engage in a practice to think reflectively about what's the point of the practice at all. It's based on a claim, and it's just a claim, that you will be a better lawyer if you understand not only how other legal systems work in the world, not just comparativism, but understand the very nature of legal systems themselves. If you think that that's useful to the production of successful good lawyers, then you have a practical, instrumental justification for the study of law itself. And one further twist, and I think this is also part of our direction of evolution, if you believe that it's always worthwhile in life to explore the deepest foundations of whatever you're doing, if you believe something like the idea that the examined life is the only one that's really worth living, then there's some inherent value, not just an instrumental value, but an inherent value in studying legal systems that are very ancient, 
that have a tremendous impact in history and that still matter in many ways unconsciously, but that still matter very much today. Now, I just want to note that underneath these different conceptions, we might also be able to sense a different theory of what law is, different jurisprudence of law. And I'm going to suggest this is actually very important for the history of religion and law at Harvard Law School. Think of Holmes, because this is the 200th anniversary of the Harvard Law School, and you really should think of Holmes, because um, there's no single figure more influential in the history of thought at the Harvard <coughs> Law School than Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., even though he only taught here for about 15 minutes before he was put on the Supreme Judicial Court. Um, that is actually true. He wrote the common law, so they would put him on the faculty. They put him on the faculty, and then he left the faculty. Um, uh, and I will mention in a few minutes um, as well uh, the person who has the most responsibility for the influence of Holmes at the Harvard Law School, and that's Felix Frankfurter. So Holmes is the one who had the substantive influence at the level of substance. Frankfurter is the reason that Holmes had this influence. So think of Holmes's most significant contribution to jurisprudence. I'm not talking about his legal history here. I'm not talking about his doctrine. I'm talking about his theory of law. Right? I think it's unquestionably the core idea of legal positivism, namely the idea that law and morality can be understood separately from each other. If you think of Holmes's famous bad man theory of the law, if you carry yourselves back to your first year of law school and to when you first thought about that, you'll see that what Holmes is doing is when he suggests that the right way to predict what law is, to define what law is, is to ask how the bad man would look at it, he's literally saying that the right way to understand what law is is to exclude morality. The heuristic of the bad man is a heuristic designed to get you to think about law with no morals in it. That is a well-known, serious, and I would stay, say to many extent, to many degrees, still embraced by many people uh, in the field of both of practical law, by many judges, and indeed by many law professors, um, as a correct account of what the law is. And um, I should note that that doesn't make a person who embraces that view immoral. To the contrary, it means that that person thinks that we can analyze morality as distinct from analyzing law. And generally, it also means that that person thinks it's a terrible idea to do law infused by morality, because you'll make mistakes. Just to give you a very concrete example of this, uh, my colleague, Professor Jack Goldsmith, uh, who very famously, uh, the day he resigned from the Department of Justice, retracted um, the so-called uh, torture memos produced by the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, under George W. Bush's administration. I should say that Professor Goldsmith was also under George W. Bush, so both the memos and their retraction took place in the Bush administration. First, so Goldsmith's considered view, and he is himself a legal positivist, is that what was wrong with those memos is that they mistakenly tried to bring moral considerations into the legal question of the legality of the executive practice that was supposed to be undertaken. Right? His view is that the John Yoo memoranda were a disastrous example of trying to mix a moral consideration, namely saving the republic, with a legal question, namely, was the president authorized to order his um, subordinates to engage in a series of interrogation practices? So since I think that Jack's decision was deeply moral, I want to be clear that the separation of law and morals is not an anti-moral position. In fact, it can be a highly pro-moral position. But jurisprudentially, it's committed to some notion of separation. Now, the shadow of Holmes's legal positivism looms large over the history of the Harvard Law School. And as I just mentioned, the case of Professor Goldsmith remains to this day. If you think that law and morals are, in some essential way, separate inquiries, there's something a little threatening about studying religious legal systems in the law school. Because religious legal systems, whatever else they may or may not have in common, are all committed to the idea that religion and morality can't be separated from law, that the two are mutually infusing, that they're one in the same process. So right there, you have a reason to explain Harvard Law School's historical skepticism of teaching religion, law, and morality together. And if you want just one, I'm going to give you a few more sociological clues to how that happens over time. You might note that all three of us and we are diverse on various dimensions, uh, have one educational fact in common, and that's that we all are graduates of the Yale Law School. <laughs> okay? That is not true of the majority of our colleagues. Right? In general, it still remains the case, almost, not, it's not fair to say almost all, 
But the great majority of professors at Yale Law School went to Yale Law School, and the great majority of professors at Harvard Law School went to Harvard Law School. There are some strange crossover people. Um, and when one explores the sociology of those strange crossover people, one often discovers something interesting. So here's, here's a first instance of that. OK, so that's the definitional part. Let me turn now to uh, the history of constitutional analysis of the religion clauses at Harvard. Now, it's both a good and a bad sign um, here that this book, uh, it's called The Garden and the Wilderness. It's by Mark DeWolf Howe, uh, whom Charlie mentioned, um, is, in my view, with the exception, of course, of books written by the people who are uh, in this room, not me, but uh, Charlie and Intasar, the most important thing ever written by a Harvard Law School professor on law and religion. And I will say two things about it. One, it's really short. I look how nice and skinny it is. Two, I would bet a nickel that most of the people in the room never heard of it before they walked in. Show of hands, how many people had heard of the garden in the wilderness? Great. So good for you, because I think it's the most remarkable you know, contribution by our faculty over 200 years to this topic. But you know, if I had said the path of the law, you know, I would have gotten a lot of hands. Right? It has not been central to the history of Harvard Law School. Why is that? Well, it's in part because what Professor Howe uh, did in this book is essentially ripped to shreds the Warren Court's jurisprudence on church and state, namely the introduction of a strong free exercise clause that on grounds of the protection of minorities, who happen to be religious minorities, but minorities, introduced very strong free exercise protections, Brennan-style free exercise protections, and simultaneously introduced a very strong establishment clause that drew, in the words of the phrase that is the target of Howe's book, a line of separation, a wall of separation between church and state. So just to give you 30 seconds, Howe's argument is that the metaphor of the wall of separation, which comes famously from Jefferson, is a mistaken metaphor for how you should think about the religion, relation between religion and law in the United States. Because he points out that although Jefferson, in his letter to the Danbury Baptists, has been interpreted later as having applied it to mean protect the government from religion by building the wall, the original use of that metaphor, which goes back to Roger Williams, the great 17th century, he was everything at various times. He was always a Protestant, but he was briefly a Baptist. Um, he was arranged by the things, but he was an important and influential religious dissident who, as you know, moved from right here in not so liberal Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, to Providence, where he created the, the colony that became uh, the Rhode Island Colony with its innovative model of religious liberty. When Williams used this metaphor, he meant it the other way around. He meant that the wall of separation should protect the garden, that's the garden of the title, of religion from the wilderness of the world, capital W, including the state. So Howe's claim, and he does it very elegantly, he was a very elegant writer, um, is to simply say, court, you've gotten it all wrong. You've gotten it exactly backwards. Now, this has been very generative for subsequent generations of scholars. I mentioned Professor Michael McConnell, professor now, was judge, before that was professor again. Um, uh, another person whom one might mention in this context because uh, he was invited to join this faculty, um, but somehow never quite agreed to join this faculty, although he did come and visit here uh, a few times. Significant because McConnell's the most influential, along with Doug Laycock, one of the two most influential figures in their generation. Um, I would say that's roughly Charlie's generation, is that correct? They're, they're younger than you are? They're younger. All right. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, as old as I am. I guess I had, a, I had a good chance of being wrong about that. So um, uh, in the generation between mine and Charlie's, let's say, they're the most influential figures who've argued church and state cases, uh, many church and state cases in the Supreme Court, while simultaneously being, um, simultaneously being academics. I would say that in our current era, um, people who are leading litigators and leading theorists in their field get invitations to join this faculty. They don't always say yes, can't think why, but they get invitations. Um, Professor Laycock, to my knowledge, never was invited to join the faculty. Professor McConnell was invited and, and said no. So not, again, not coincidental, I think, in this broader picture. So Howe's insights have been very generative for McConnell. McConnell never cites him. And I'm not sure that McConnell is even fully conscious of the centrality 
of, uh, of Howe's argument. And that's also significant. Because I don't think that in the years after Howe's book was written, that it was received as dominant scholarly wisdom. I think it's the kind of work that has to be rediscovered by subsequent generations of analysts, which is partly the reason that the people who chose to come to the Law and Religion panel haven't heard of the most important book by a Harvard Law professor on the topic. Now, here I'm going to come to Felix Frankfurter. I mentioned that Frankfurter is the person who translated Holmes into the uh, institutional life of the Harvard Law School. He did this when he was a young faculty member here. He did this when, on the Supreme Court, he put a lot of time and effort into getting Harvard faculty members hired. He would pick his, mostly his own law clerks, but sometimes other people's law clerks, and send them on to Harvard. Um, he would call the dean, and he would tell him to hire people, and the dean generally listened. And the faculty, at the time, mostly did what the dean wanted. One or two exceptions, but not very many. So John Mansfield, um, whom you mentioned, was a Frankfurter clerk. I have seen the letter in which he instructs the dean, Dean Griswold, to hire uh, Mansfield. Um, and you know, this was a sort of standard kind of thing. In that letter, it's all in the library right here, Frankfurter compares uh, Mansfield and Henry Steiner, and they, they both get hired. Um, so I, I don't think it's possible to overstate in historical terms um, the influence that Frankfurter had on the conceptual life of the law school over a long period of time. And Frankfurter had, by his own account, a profoundly ambivalent relationship with the constitutional law of religion and government. And further by his own account, and now I'm hinting at my third topic, that relationship was deeply infused by Frankfurter's very complex relationship with his own Jewishness. Now, there's one dominant text that explicates this, and it's Frankfurter's dissent in uh, the Barnett decision, which is the second of the two famous flag salute cases. These are World War II era cases. They were both decided during the years of the war, in the first of which a group of Jehovah's Witnesses children refused to salute the flag, and the court holds that the local town may obligate them to salute the flag and may expel them if they don't salute. Then two years later, the court flips in a famous opinion by Justice Jackson, and it says, over a dissent by Justice Frankfurter, who wrote the first opinion, that um, it is a uh, matter of fundamental constitutional liberty that no one shall be obligated to salute the flag. It's the birth of many things. Uh, and doctrinal, it's a very important opinion by Justice Jackson. It's a very uh, important historical uh, moment in the history of the court. In his dissent in that case, Frankfurter, who felt that he was being repudiated as the liberal leader of the court, which, he was, which was actually happening. Like, he wasn't wrong about that. He was being repudiated in that moment. Uh, famously wrote a strange, strange opening to his opinion, where he begins by saying, essentially, that as a Jew, he says, as a member of the most persecuted and vilified minority in history, he knows what discrimination is. And this, requiring the Jehovah's Witness to salute the flag, is not discrimination. And he goes on to say that as judges, we are neither Jew nor Gentile. He means to say there, and he's uh, quoting, well, he's reframing Paul in a very self-conscious way, that as a judge, I must suppress my particularistic religious identity. Now, leave aside how fascinating it is that he's doing this weird thing where in the US reports he's referring to his religious identity in the very same sentence that he says that as a judge, he cannot take account of his religious identity. That's kind of a remarkable move. But the core of his argument is that to be an exponent of the US Constitution is to set aside and equalize all religious difference. And that's why he needs to quote Paul. Right? In Paul's conclusion, there is neither male nor female, nor Jew nor Gentile, for all are one in Christ Jesus. For Frankfurter, in his, his paraphrase, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, all are one under the Constitution. And he often said on his own, Frankfurter, that he had, and this is clearly shown here, he had replaced, this is his own word, he had replaced his Judaism with allegiance to the Constitution. So now I come to my final topic, and that is the question of displacement and the question of Jews in the history of the Harvard Law School. A, a book could be written about this. Many books could be written about it. What's really significant is that no one has bothered to do so. <laughs> That's because, I would argue, that Frankfurter's 
model. And remember, when Frankfurter first joined the faculty at Harvard Law School, he was the only Jew on the Harvard Law School faculty and one of only a handful of Jews in the whole of Harvard University. By the time his influence on the law school began to wane, probably in the 1970s, and more than a decade after he died, the faculty was certainly majority Jewish um, and possibly super majority Jewish, a fact that one ought not to say in these halls. I almost think that the, the ceiling will cave in on me for saying this, especially if it's on, if it's on tape, but it's just a sociological fact and I'm describing it as a sociological fact. It's a sociological fact that cannot be mentioned at the Harvard Law School. It cannot be mentioned because of this Frankfurtarian ideal. And it also cannot be mentioned in practical terms because in sociological historical terms, Harvard Law School was an institution that played a huge role in the assimilation of American Jews into positions of societal and cultural power in the United States. We heard a lot uh, yesterday from uh, the video and from Dean Manning about the central leadership role of Harvard University in this democracy. But until recently, and it remains the case for some, partly for demographic reasons, Jews were disproportionately not especially likely to get elected to things in the United States. But they were disproportionately likely to nevertheless play important leadership roles, and the law was a vector for that occurring. So within that sociological framework, it was crucial for those Jews not to think of themselves as primarily Jews with respect to their professional expressions. That might be one reason why we've had an Islamic legal studies program since 1991 and a program uh, on Jewish and Israeli law, the Julius Rabinowitz program, since 2016. Right? We, we got a very generous gift to found that program and I somehow I think we might have been able to find a gift for that at some point prior to 2016. I don't think there was any lack of donors. I just don't think anyone particularly thought of trying and there was something perhaps worrisome about so trying. I think here of um, uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz's anecdote about uh, attending a dinner at uh, Dean Griswold's house when he, Alan Dershowitz, as a young professor, uh, still kept kosher. And uh, Griswold saying to him, you don't actually do those sorts of things, do you? And Alan says in his book um, that that kept him kosher for at least several more years. <laughs> Alan's an interesting counterpoint here, uh, you know, uh, a, a very publicly visible Harvard Law professor who very much uh, wore and wears his Jewishness on his sleeve, I will say to some discomfiture, uh, perhaps of some of his colleagues, present company, and I'm speaking of myself now, possibly not excluded. So the, the conclusion that I'm going to reach here is that over time, as the law school has become a more diverse place, as it's become a place with a broader conception of what law is, as it's become a place with a broader set of views about the relationship between law and morality, the temperature is reduced with respect to these questions of deferral or I might even say denial. It's now much easier in a calmer way to discuss Jewish legal studies alongside Islamic legal studies, alongside uh, canon law and uh, a new program that's actually in the process of being formed here now on Christianity and the law. That is a good development. That is a good development. That is a naturalizing development. Um, and I think that it, what will flow from that, among other things, apart from, I hope, better scholarship, may also be a broader contribution to the law of church and state in the United States as religion becomes something that you actually can talk about and as it becomes possible to mention God on Mass Ave uh, without the walls collapsing. So thanks for listening. Um, and uh, I'm, I said a lot of things which are deserving of disagreement, uh, and there are many oversimplifications here, but I am eager to hear your comments on all three of our uh, presentations. I'm going to just do the operation of removing the uh, lectern here so that you can, uh, can start talking. And uh, yeah.